Please welcome one of the most inspiring voices of our times, Greta Thunberg! <laughs> Nice to see you. You too. How much fun was that? It was really fun. Yeah. <laughs> what, I, uh, what I loved most about it was it was because they were kids, like most people treat you obviously with a real mm. reverence, but because they were like six, mm. quickly they were like, who's she? <laughs> like, was that kind of nice to just be like... It is very nice. Yeah. And the thing that I remember as well, we will get on to serious matters, but was when we found out what was in your wardrobe. <laughs> Do you remember this? Yes. Do you want to tell everyone what was in your wardrobe? Um, I've got, uh, I've got beans. <laughs> it was just beans and milk. Yeah. <laughs> so just beans and milk in a wardrobe. And I think one of the kids pointed out that it sounded like a bleak nanny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was curious, has... Is there more stuff in the wardrobe, or is it still scarce? I've got even more beans now. <laughs> I also save them for my friends. I have a specific friend who, every time they get to my place, I give them beans. <laughs> well, do you mind if I ask why? Do they need more fibre in their diet? What's the... We're both autistic. OK. That says a lot. Does it? Yeah. What, autistic people like beans? <laughs> In my experience, at least. <laughs> I mean, does anyone else feel uneasy? Because <laughs> I've never had this conversation before and it feels like, you know, we're very much walking on ice. <laughs> well, my brain wants to know, so why do autistic people like bit? Are you counting them? What's... <laughs> I, don't know, like, I don't know, it's just like... Well, genuinely, if that's the thing, because if I meet somebody who's autistic now, I want to be able to say with confidence... <laughs> that I go, do you like beans? And uh, if they go, how fucking dare you? I can't know. <laughs> but if they go, you like beans, huh? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> Greta okay, Thunberg. Here's the thing. Yeah, um, I'm listening. I'm all ears. <laughs> when I was sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> good start to any bean story. <laughs> I didn't have much to do. So I sat there and ate one bean at a time. And then I that became some kind of comfort food. Wow. So <laughs> when I'm Stressed, eight beans one at a time. <laughs> this is phenomenal. <laughs> Why wasn't that in Castaway with Tom Hanks? <laughs> That's a good question. They should replace that volleyball. Yeah. <laughs> now you're here to talk about the climate book. Um, I I've read it. It's fantastic. It's not just you. It's it's you and basically like a hundred other scientists and people you admire, isn't it? Yes, exactly. The whole idea of the book is a kind of, I for some reason, have a platform that I can use. So I create a book where I invite people, some of the world's most leading scientists and people who are experiencing the first-hand consequences of the climate emergency, for them to share their expertise and to tell their stories. So I read it, and, and it, it's a real barrage of, mm. of worry, which is what you yeah. could have called it. But, yeah. <laughs> but it, it just, you know, it was like, wow, wow. It was like this kind of mm. onslaught. It almost feels like the book is like this collection of almost, if you want to know lots of little things about climate, mm. this is the place to go to. Is that fair? Kind of, I guess. Uh, because so, so many times people approach me and ask like, I want to get more involved in the climate issue and I want to learn more, but I don't know where to start. Yeah. And so I've never had the kind of like, you read this, you find lots of stuff in there. Yeah. So I wanted to create that myself and as you say there's some quite heavy stuff in there um, but I believe that we can only actually do something we can only change if we do understand the situation we are in um, so it's not only something to provide us with information but also a call to action yeah because that's what it felt like the whole thing is about trying to recognize that we're in the middle of an emergency mm, yeah exactly because it feels like we're still in a state of denial the climate crisis is treated as a side topic it's not present everywhere as it would be if we were treated as, as an existential crisis. Yeah. Because the thing that got me, I was sort of reading it and I just felt, maybe it's that I felt old. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I walked on to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I sort of read it with this, like, I was curious as to how you... Do you ever feel despair because you always seem like you're full of hope 
because I was sort of reading it going, wow, so the, the richest 1% emit 50% of carbon emissions. God, how do we stop doing them? Okay, so if I become vegan, that feels like a small thing. Do you know what I mean? I was sort of, mm. I, f I felt a bit helpless. Yeah. I, I mean, this feeling despair is a luxury. It's a privilege. The fact that we have an option to take action uh, shows that we have a privilege, yeah. um, which means that we need to use that. Um, we are not the ones who, who are experiencing the consequences of the climate emergency. We, we see it as, as a far away topic. Many people around the world, countless of people around the world, are already suffering and are risking losing their lives and livelihoods from it. Um, and so despair is just not an option. Yeah, I think that's what I like about the book is that it's just, it's this kind of blizzard of different experiences that we don't always see on the, on the news. Like yeah. the news kind of, you know, focuses on politics or kind of celebrity tittle tattle. But it's almost like if you were to show sort of genuine things that were happening in various parts of the world, it yeah. becomes a lot more immediate. Exactly. When we think of the climate crisis, I think many people think of polar bears yeah. and collapsing glaciers and so on. And of course, that's a part of it, but it's not, um, it's not something that we can identify with. Um, the climate crisis and the environmental crisis has many, many different faces. Um, and we need to connect them. We need to connect the dots and we need to start reading between the lines and see how this is impacting people already today. What would you like the impact of the book to be? I, I mean, I, as I said, I think that, I hope that people will get a bit more informed about the crisis. And when you are fully aware of, of the full consequences of the climate emergency and of the urgency, I believe that people will know what to do. Mm. And, and from there, we can start taking action. We need to build and create a kind of critical mass of people. We need to spread awareness to as many as we possibly can. Um, and, and going from there to push, put pressure on, on those in power. Mm. And the bit that you wrote about earning hope, I really liked that. Yeah. Hope is, is, is a verb. It is something that you, you, you need to do. It is something that you need to earn. You can't just sit uh, and lean back and, and expect you to be given hope um, by someone else. You can't really wait for someone else to do something. Hope is something that you need to create. Um, so that's, that's what I mean. With and the irony being that you are creating hope, but for a lot of people, you are hope. So people go, oh, I don't need to do anything because hope's on it. Yeah, and that's contraproductive. Yeah, uh, yeah but like... yet you are hope, but you're not hope. <laughs> yeah. But, but do you know what I mean? Like, do, do you ever feel that sense of like people go, ah, it's all right, she's cool, she's exactly, got it. Exactly, all the time. Um, and it, um, it feels like pe people constantly approach me and other climate activists and say like, oh, it's, I feel so hopeful now. I feel like I can relax because... The young people, they have understood it. I don't need to do anything. Now. Right. You, the, the kids are all right. I mean, the kids are not all right. Yeah. If, if you expect, if you have all your hope resting on the shoulders of, of uh, close to burned out teenagers, that's not sustainable. Yeah. How do you feel when you, because what, what's so interesting about your book, like you say, you see this sort of cross section of different points of view and people from all over the world. How do you feel when the climate change conversation is dominated by people throwing kind of paint on a painting. Yeah. I feel that's kind of, it's kind of misleading because the ones who are really leading this fight are, are the ones living on the front lines. Yeah. It is mainly indigenous communities, indigenous peoples, um, people living in the most affected areas yeah. who, are, who are in many cases li risking their, their, their lives and their freedom in order to, to, to protest against this. Um, so, I mean, of course, it's people need to take action, yeah. but we need to, to um, to send to those on the front lines. Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you kind of, we can all agree we want to save the planet, but mm. if somebody's sort of standing in front of an ambulance, you're like, don't do that, mate. Don't give people an excuse yeah. to not want to do something that we all believe in. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's time to decolonize the climate movement at, and pass over the mic to those who have stories to tell. Yeah, yeah, right. Do you wake up with that sense of uh, purpose every day? It's, a, it's definitely a marathon. Yeah. Um, and you have to, you have to know that from the beginning what you what you get yourself into, um, which I didn't. How old were you? I was 15 when I started school striking, and I was just like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna go school strike. I didn't really think like, oh, this might lead to a global movement, but it did. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and no one would have be able to to um, to see that coming.
What is that like when your single action explodes into this kind of global movement? What is that like for you? I mean, that's, it's not really possible to describe. Yeah. I mean, the contrast is so, so big, so it's like, it takes a while to get used to. Mm. Because you were like, you only really spoke to your parents, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I had um, selective mutism. I couldn't speak to, to people other than uh, my parents, my sister and one of my teachers. Yeah. And, and, and going from that to, to s s try to speak to the whole world is different. But, um, but just unbelievable in terms of that sort of trajectory. Yeah. Crazy. But also, it was, um, it was definitely stepping out of my comfort zone. But then I thought, like, well, we're an existential, in an existential crisis. People are dying. Like, the least I can do is to step out of my comfort zone and do a few interviews. The other thing I found fascinating is that you're not actually making any money from this book, are you? No, no. Um, because all the royalties that I would have made will go to charity. Yeah, right. There's... So how do you earn money? Uh, study, I, because you get money for studying. Do you? Yeah. What a country. <laughs> do, in Sweden, they pay you to study? Yeah. What a fucking world. <laughs> Not much. Not much. No, but, you know, it's more than here. We, we have to pay to, to study. Yeah. It's only when you say it like that you realise how mental it is. Yeah. Do you want to read a book? Yeah, it costs you 50 grand. <laughs> Seems fair, and there'll be interest on that. Okay. Yeah. But it, so, so basically, you're still at school. Yes. And you're a full-time activist. Yes. So, what are your ways of relaxing? I make frog hats. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Four frogs. No. It's a little grunt. So nice to hear a grunt. <laughs> That's when you know someone's really enjoying themselves. That's the first time I've ever met someone as famous as you. Go. Um, <laughs> Delightful to hear, but it's just that's when you know someone who's really having fun because you don't want to make that noise <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you know what I mean? It's just like it's gonna be all right. There's something I don't know what it is I've genuinely my favorite this sounds weird. I love it when I make old ladies laugh so much they wet themselves <laughs> I don't know why, but honestly, it's that moment. There'll be a few in here today, but... <laughs> and you can see their eyes like that, they're kind of... <laughs> and you're like, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> get ready, Margaret, get ready. <laughs> you grunt away, enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, do, do you feel 19, or do you feel like you've packed so much more into your life so far? I, I, d I definitely don't feel like 19. Yeah. It's like one day it's 10 and the other day it's like 70. <laughs> right. There's no in between. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, yeah, exactly, because it's like speaking with such passion, such authority, such knowledge, and then oh. frog hats. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I love about us, other than, you know, the fact that people think I look like your dad, <laughs> um, <laughs> do I look like your dad? No, you do okay. not. <laughs> but what does your dad look like? He, he looks like me, but older, with beard. With a beard. So, yeah, I kind can't... Of. All right, mate. Um, <laughs> so I, I can't grow a beard. It kind of is all gingery and it just... <laughs> so, we've actually got something in common, that we've both... We've, um, there's been lots of conspiracy theories about us, more about you, but there's been a few about me, that there's a, there's a rumour that... It's in the Daily Star, which is a national newspaper here, mm. that I wanted to open a gym... <laughs> For... <laughs> but specifically, a gym for pensioners. And <laughs> there was another that I was a Scientologist, and there was another one that I'd been in, in a, in a porn pornographic film. <laughs> and, you know, and I've never opened a gym. So the thing is... <laughs> I, I, but, but my favourite conspiracy theory about you Mm. is that this is not the first time you've been on this earth. That, in fact, Greta was here in 1898, and she's a time traveller. <laughs> it does look like you, though. Yeah, I mean... Mm. It's got this, the, the hair's... From very... a distance, yeah. Yeah? What would you do if you could travel? I mean, it's a random question. Mm. If you could time travel, where would you go? 
I mean, I, I don't know. It feels like this is a very decisive time in human history. It is during this decade, what we do during this decade and what we don't do, that will define the, the future of humanity for the coming uh, centuries and millennia. Yeah. It feels like this is a good time to, to be active. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, there's a photo of you and me that I put up on my Instagram. And, you know, I would say, like, 90% of people were like, oh, it's really cool, blah, blah, blah. But it was a real window into... There's a lot of venom towards <laughs> you. How is that, dealing with that level of sort of... It's, and it's mostly kind of old men that yeah. seem to really mm -hmm. have a problem with you. Yeah, it's, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Mm. But, like, for me, it's like I can just go in there and just have free meme material. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... Limited. Yeah, yeah. So, so hang on. So if they give you a meme, and, and by the way, you've just created a meme because you just did that on telly. <laughs> so <laughs> there's now going to be people in strip clubs doing the Greta. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what you do? So if someone makes a meme about you, you try and own it. Of and course, yeah. I share it with my friends, and then I take credit for it. And they're like, "Oh, <laughs> where did you find that?" <laughs> oh, really? Oh, that's <laughs> superb. I mean, it's, it's, it's a w bit weird when among the most powerful people in the world and also just, like, people generally, like, um, heterosexual, cis, uh, white, privileged, middle-aged men who feel so threatened by kind of children, teenagers, <laughs> yeah. just stating facts um, that they feel like they must, <laughs> they must send some kind of letter or just kind of vent online, yeah. it's, it's very weird. It isn't it? it <clears throat> there is something really strange about it, I don't understand, but you're so bang on, it's like, children with facts would appear to be the most terrifying thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To but a like, certain type they of wouldn't be doing. They wouldn't be spending their time doing that if they didn't feel threatened by it, if they didn't feel like we had an impact. Yeah, yeah. Here's another question, this is a slightly random one, I need mm. you to imagine something. So, there is no climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Everything is hunky-dory. <clears throat> it's all what fun. What is that? Hunky-dory, oh, yeah. So... <laughs> it's only when you say that out loud that I find myself <laughs> really struggling. But for whatever reason, in England, we have a phrase called hunky-dory, mm -hmm. which means mm. it's all right. OK. And I don't know why. <laughs> kind of like alte tip-top. Kind yes, of. also, it's like, also, it's, but it's just what I love about travelling. I remember my friend, Kumar, we were in uh, Sweden, in Stockholm, and he used the phrase pussyfooting. <laughs> and, yeah, see, here, fine. <laughs> but in, 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 in Sweden, a, a, to a waitress, a pussyfooter sounds like someone who's going to do something really peculiar. <laughs> but it means, actually, to dilly-dally. <laughs> <laughs> another word. That means nothing. Anyway, so the world is uh, tickety boo, and uh, <laughs> it's fine. Like there's no climate. Yeah. What would you do <clears throat> if, you, if if you didn't have to be an activist? I would make even more frog hats. Right. <laughs> and there you go. That's what we do. While I was doing that, I would also enjoy just going to school like everyone else, having maybe a regular job, trying to do something to help to help people, um, and not having to to spend all my all my time just just to try to fight against the the possible destruction of our civilization as we know it. It yeah. would be nice to have some kind of yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, how do you watch a box set when that's in the back of your head? <laughs> I, I read a lovely story about you, um, that there's always a song playing in your head mm -hmm. when, you, when you meet people, is that right? All the time, just... And is that two things? Is that a coping mechanism? And two, what's the song currently playing? I, <laughs> I do think it's, it's a coping mechanism because that makes me be able to... If, there, if you're, like, in a press crush, um, that's what we call it in FFF, when, when you're just surrounded by, by press and you just you can't move. Yeah. Um, or something like that. To have something to go through, it's, 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 uh, it makes you cope with it. Um, today I have a Swedish song um, by a Swedish artist I don't, know, I don't expect you to know. Uh, it's by Säker, it's called For Jag. For Jörd, how does it go? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's offensive. I went, is it? Is it? <laughs> 
I didn't. I was trying to. What does so uh, for yard? For yard. For yard. Like may I kind of. May, oh, may I? Yeah. So what did I say? <laughs> I have. Um, <laughs> for yard. <laughs> That's what I heard. I heard for yard. <laughs> So is that what's been going on in your head while we've been chatting for your... Yeah. How does it go? For... Um, it's, um... Because <laughs> I'm hearing for your... For your... For your... For your... My close? Um, not really, no. Is it more for to the yard, to the yard, to the floor? <laughs> No, it's like, for your trip, I will. You have no other reason to do it. It's Swedish, so it sounds like Bogus. No, it sounds lovely. And yeah. it, sounds like, it's, it sounds very calming. It is. And what's, um, what's next? This is the last thing you're doing on this sort of latest publicity. Yeah, um, I've, I have break from school now, uh, autumn break. Half term? Uh, yeah. So, so then I, uh, I will go back uh, for Sweden tomorrow. Um, it's a, like a 35-hour train journey. Um, so, and then I will go um, to do some stuff there, and then I start school on Monday again. Hype! <laughs> are you are you looking forward to being back at school? Yes. Just... We're gonna we're gonna start researching things. We're gonna do for reports. Are we... <laughs> so nerdy. <laughs> but see, this is what I love about you. So you have this. So are you as into your studies as you are trying to save the planet? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> So what is the, what's the big thing you love at the minute? I used to love war poetry. That really got me off. Like, as a kid. <laughs> as in... <laughs> All right, just ignore those pigs. <laughs> I used to... Like, I remember that was the first time Dulcier Decorum Est Pro Patria Mori. I was like, yes, what's that? I was fascinated by it. Um, what, what's, the, what's the lesson for you? I just... Just learning, I like. Uh, just it, learning. I, and, and I just, like... I can be... So so excited and just bubbly inside, just knowing that I'm going to go home and have my routines again. Right, wow. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. But that's that is such a window into the effort that you put in. Like, given that you, like, clearly, mm. you know, you're autistic, you kind of want, right, you, you, you <laughs> want your school and your beans. And, <laughs> but like, but do you know what I mean? Like, just yeah. kind of like that. But the very fact that you're, you've got showing the bravery to step out of that for the greater good is magnificent. And again, I think back to when I was 19, I dyed my hair blue and went to Magaluf. <laughs> like, because <laughs> I thought it would impress girls. But it was like, it wasn't like that colour blue, which is what I wanted it to be. It was like sort of dark. It looked, mm. you know, have you, ever, you know those uh, good luck trolls you used to have on pencils? Mm. <laughs> looked like one of them. Brutal. You ever been to Magaluf? <laughs> Do you want to go to Magaluf? Let's... I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, Magaluf is... A, it's, it's a magical place. <laughs> it's, it's basically it's where a lot of young English people go to get drunk. Fun. For, it, it's... yeah. <laughs> Although, when I went there, we got on a bus, and I'm telling you stories I don't need to, but... <laughs> it was that we were greeted by, weirdly, people dressed as giant M&Ms. And it was, <laughs> it was all that <laughs> music. And I remember seeing a bus full of old people thinking, I wouldn't mind getting on that. <laughs> it looked more my style. Now, let's get back to the book. So, the, the climate book is out now. Mm -hmm. Is there... W what is the most important thing, would you say, for people to, to take from it? Um, I think... Um, the purpose of it is to kind of provide information of the many different sides to the climate crisis and environmental crisis and to connect these. Uh, and I think the most powerful thing is, is first to have, to have the explanation, to have the, the many different chapters um, so that you can read all of them and then make your own conclusions, uh, read between the lines. But I think that it's so powerful to have it physically there. It's like, and it's so heavy, it's like a brick. I it's know, like, she's a big one. <laughs> she is, man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what? It, it's a big book. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Do you not personify things? It's so much fun. <laughs> so, my friend Steve... <laughs> um, <laughs> everything in his house is personified and has been passed down to his children. So, he made some bread the other day and his seven-year-old kid felt the bread and went, she's a warm one. <laughs> 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 It's a real window. No, I'm 
margin and because I'm trying to get rid of this, that's what he said, that's what she said, jokes, because I've been spending so much time with people who say that all the time, so I'm trying to get rid of that. So you're trying to get rid of that's what she said? <laughs> And now, I don't I, want to personify things. You, you don't want to personify things? OK. Yeah, but Fine. anyway, um, <laughs> where was I? <laughs> where were you? I don't know. <laughs> so the climate book. Yeah. 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 To have something physically... That book, we're, that's where it went. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're back to the book. Yeah, yeah. To have something, because people say all, so, all so, sorts of weird things, and they accuse us of lying and being all, alarmist and just to have it black and white like we have this this we have truth on our side we have moral morality on our side we have the science on our side just to have it there like no matter what they say this won't change yes um this is going to be true yeah um it's just very powerful to have yeah so is the plan you want to have it in every household just have it in public places and libraries so that people can just have it to hand yeah you... as, as many places as possible so, uh, See, what, again, what struck me about reading the book, I was like, how is it that we have all this evidence, we have all this scientific kind of fact, and this has been around for a while, and yet it feels like governments and companies have just been amazing at yeah. sort of dealing with it and creating exactly. loopholes? We have lost decades to, to the people in power distracting, delaying and outright denying these things that we are seeing that are now unequivocal. Um, and that is time that we won't get back. Mm. And therefore, it is extremely crucial that we now use our time wisely. Every one of us who have the opportunity of doing something must make it our mission to spread awareness to as many as possible um, to try to, to deal with that mis misinformation, um, etc. So we have a lot to compensate for. What would you say, final question, if, if somebody came up to you and said, what could I do mm. to help? What would you say? I would say become an activist, join us on the streets, um, uh, join the movement, help organize. We need as many as possible. Um, right now, there are way too few people in, engaged in this. We are many, we are millions around the world, but we need billions. Um, so in, in order to change everything, we need everyone. Lovely stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, one absolutely wonderful chat. Please give it up for the fantastic... <laughs> Kimber.